You know, the day I found out that I was a sinner going to hell was the best day of my life because it told me where to go, where to look, where to find the solution, and it was the truth. And Jesus says, the truth will set you free. I want to start to answer this question, uh, how do we reach a Greek culture? How do we reach, uh, how do we take ground for the gospel in a Babylon-style uh, experience? Uh, the answer, actually, is that each of us must be an outpost, uh, an embassy, uh, a citizen of another kingdom, another place. Uh, we must serve another power, uh, we must serve a superior God, uh, and we must be those, uh, and we must be in, in, our, in our hearts, the government of that kingdom and the power of that God must be at work. We need to be that final outpost. Uh, hearts, minds, and lives that represent territory uh, that the kingdom of Babylon and the kingdoms of this world cannot conquer. Um, four men like that left a mark on ancient Babylon. Four. That's all we read of. And what a light they were in that place. Uh, and what a work of God's grace was done through them. You know, uh, 12 men like that, or a small upper room of people like that, turned ancient Rome upside down. How many of us will there be in the United States of America when the chips are really down? You know, by the grace of God, I trust there'll be many, many more than 12. Certainly many, many more than four. And I wonder what God will do in the next generation with the Daniels, uh, the 12 disciples of our generation. Um, but whilst that sounds very grand and exciting, uh, it needs to begin somewhere less glamorous, somewhere much more personal, because the reality is that it begins with you and with me. It is the life that we live in Christ, the testimony that we have to our world, and you say, well, what kind of life is this? What kind of testimony is this? Well, I'm glad you asked. It's the life and the testimony that Jesus left for us in the Sermon on the Mount. And I would like to read you some verses from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. And see here certain qualities, character traits, and then a certain impact that he's had, not on just those near to us, not just on the church, but on the world. Uh, Matthew 5, it says, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain and he sat down. His disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You, I want you to get the picture here, by the way, a lot of ordinary people sitting in front of Jesus. And look, there's just ordinary old you and me in the auditorium today. And he's standing in front of ordinary old you and me saying, you, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. And again, you, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may say, see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. 
Let me make a comment about the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, it occurs in Matthew's Gospel, and many of you will know that Matthew's Gospel is often called the Gospel of the Kingdom because it is full of references to the Kingdom of God and the Kingdom of Heaven. Um, and so far in Matthew, up to chapter 5, we've seen a lot of that. Chapter 1, we see that Jesus is born into a royal family, David's family. In chapter 2, we see the announcement that there is a newborn king of the Jews. In chapter 3, you see John the Baptist going about saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In chapter 4, Jesus himself says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then at the end of chapter 4, just a couple of verses before where we started to read in chapter 5, verse 1, it says about Jesus that he went throughout all Galilee proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. But it's interesting, if you really think about it and read it carefully, you think that, well, there's something a little bit strange going on, because nothing about the story so far looks very kingly or kingdomy, if I could put it that way. There's no army, uh, there's no palace, there's no postage stamps or passports, or there's no territory being taken, there's no nationhood. What is it about this whole thing that is a kingdom? Um, it's not that these things are absent because the whole thing is a scam. It's not that it's a great big disappointment, although some people were disappointed because they were waiting for a palace and they were waiting for an army and they were waiting for a nation and they didn't get it. And they were disappointed because they wanted power and might. There's a sense in which the coming of Jesus into the world is a rejection of the world's way. It's a rejection of our view of power and strength. It is saying actually the weakness of God is stronger than men. Um, and Jesus comes and He doesn't have these things and we say, therefore, well, what's the lesson? If this isn't the way of God through Christ, what is the way? Well, the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't begin with all these things. It begins somewhere else. You know, the kingdom of God, if you look up in the Oxford Dictionary, kingdom, it'll talk about the extent of the rule of a monarch. And the kingdom of God is, first of all, the rule and reign of God in the hearts of men and women. Your heart is the territory of God's kingdom. My heart is the territory, the extent of the rule and the reign of God in the world. And when God's kingdom is coming, what we see is changed people. When God's kingdom is coming, we see a radically transformed heart. And when God's kingdom is coming in our life, this is the proof, things start to change. And when we read those Beatitudes, you will see a bunch of characteristics, a bunch of qualities of heart in, in, that describe the ways in which we are changed. But then as you keep reading, you realize that that change that happens within is a change that then starts to affect the world around us. And that was the salt and the light and also the peacemaking. But prior to that, it begins here and it goes out there. And that's the kingdom of God. That's how it comes and that's how it spreads through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we go into these traits, which I want to mention one by one this morning, this afternoon, sorry, um, I want to sort of set it up by saying there is an overall kind of theme to these character traits. We read them, right? Poor in spirit, uh, mourn, meek, hunger and thirst for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, uh, persecuted, and then salt and light. Um, there's a certain theme here, there's a logical progression. And the logical progression could be described in the words of Simeon. Remember in Luke's Gospel when uh, uh, Mary and Joseph go up to the temple with, with uh, the baby Jesus and there's Simeon is there and Anna the prophetess is there and they go into the temple and Simeon takes the child in his arms and holds it up and he says something very strange. He says, this child is set for the falling and the rising again of many. There's a great wisdom in what he said. Um, there's a great wisdom in the reality that actually the gospel that will be proclaimed in the name of Jesus will see many human hearts fall 
and rise again. Um, you think about it. Poor in spirit describes a kind of poverty. Mourning, it describes a kind of sadness. Meekness, it describes a kind of humility. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, it describes a kind of uh, uh, starvation. There's a, there's, a, there's a tearing down of a person that takes place through the gospel. There's taking out the old and throwing it away. There's a destruction that happens in the heart. And it is the pitching out of all that is sinful and wrong and wicked. But then, of course, we turn the corner and what do the next Beatitudes say? Uh, meek, hungry, oh, pure in heart. Well, that's a positive quality. Merciful, oh, hang on. Now they're starting to get the attributes of God coming into the heart. Peacemakers, well, they're having an effect and influence on the world around them. You see that there's a, a falling and a rising. Let me describe it this way. Uh, I remember uh, some time ago, um, there was a guy moved into our neighborhood and built this great big flash house, this fancy sort of mansion. And uh, it was very nice. Anyway, he only lived there for a couple of years and then he left and he sold the place. And when he sold the place, another guy bought it. And uh, we all knew, oh yeah, that house has been sold, interesting. Um, nicest house in the neighborhood. Uh, and then this guy that came in to buy it, he did a very strange thing. We're driving down the street one day and we went, went past and the front yard of that house was just full of debris. And there was all these workmen on site and they were completely gutting it. They were tearing out everything, which seemed very strange. It was a brand new home, it was very beautiful. And dad being dad, pulls over, gets out, walks over to the fence, signals to one of the workmen, what's going on? And they start having a chat. Oh, the new owner, he's tearing it all out, wants to start with a clean slate, going right back to the boards in every room. Interesting. You know, that's what God does to us when his kingdom comes to us. There is that tearing out, that destruction that pulling out of the old man, as the Apostle Paul would say, and then there's the rebuilding, there's the sanctification, and there's the bringing of all that is right and good from himself into the heart and soul of a human being. There is an emptying that takes place in repentance, and then there is a filling of the human soul that takes place through all the fullness of Christ. And the Beatitudes describe that process, and they begin here, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Notice, whose is the kingdom of heaven? People of a certain character. Second note, this is the litmus test. This is, like, it's these people, not other people. These people. It's theirs that is the kingdom of heaven. Those that are, not others, those that are actually poor in spirit. And you say, well, what, what does that mean? What is poor in spirit? Well, poor, think about it, it means to be destitute, it means to be uh, nearly bankrupt, it means to be wanting, to be needy, to be lacking, it means to have nothing of value. Where is that poverty? Where do we have nothing of value? Where are we needy? Where are we empty? In our spirit. It's those people who know that. The kingdom of heaven is coming to them. That's a very difficult one for the modern age in which we live. Everything we hear every day is calculated against that message. It is strange really to think, how does Jesus describe the quality of heart that God is working in a human soul? He begins with poor in spirit, the dead opposite to what our world will say. They'll say, no, 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 no. From the earliest age, believe in yourself. Be yourself, that's the most excellent pursuit. To find out who you are and you just do you, they'll say, and be your best self. Don't be poor in your spirit. Find the worth. Find the value. Find the self-esteem, they'll say. It's the age of self-love, self-help, self-care, self-esteem, self-expression, self-confidence, the selfie. It's true, right? The rise and rise of the gospel of identity is what we're seeing in our day. Find out who you are. There's the blueprint for life. Celebrate it. Learn to love it. Surround yourself with people who see you, who acknowledge you, who give you visibility. And the cry of the age is, this is just who I am, or I did what was right for me. There's no such thing as right for you. There's right and there's wrong, and you can do one or the other. 
We've eroded even the integrity of the Christian message to pander to this modern age of self. You know, I was uh, at a conference once and one of the speakers was up talking about the fact that a famous guy in Australia had shared a Bible verse on his Instagram account and it was 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 9 through 11. Such were some of you, right? Do not be deceived, neither adulterers or drunkards or fornicators or homosexuals or whatever will inherit the kingdom of God, but such were some of you, but you are washed, you are sanctified. He shares that on his Instagram. And the Christian speaker who was speaking said, well, that probably wasn't very wise. He could have been more loving. It's interesting, I actually went up to talk to him afterwards and I said, what did you mean when you said more loving? What does that mean? And we had a conversation, we didn't get very far. But what he actually meant, <laughs> what he actually meant was, he could have made people feel better about themselves. Do you know what? That's not the gospel. You know, the day I found out that I was a sinner going to hell was the best day of my life. Because it told me where to go, where to look, where to find the solution, and it was the truth. And Jesus says, the truth will set you free. Um, we have redefined love to mean making people feel positive. What a lie from Satan that is, when Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Truth is positive and negative. I mean, overall, it's a marvelous thing. But boy, if you get rid of the negatives, you are not addressing the truth of the human soul in the way that we ought. Uh, we say, well, the God, I went to a school once, and I was getting ready to get up and speak and the school principal comes and puts his hand on my shoulder and he says, he says, brother, he says, we just want to hear from you today a real positive message. I thought, well, I was going to, but I won't now. Um, <laughs> actually, I was getting up to tell the young folks about their sin. Uh, and again, there's a Christian radio station in Australia and the, uh, the, the tagline was, um, the city was Brisbane, Brisbane's positive alternative. And the whole theme of the radio station was positivity. And that's Christianity, what a lie. Truth is positive and negative. I mean, hell is real, sin is real. Poor in spirit is the threshold requirement for the kingdom of heaven. Or that Christians don't judge, we say. Well, no, Christians just know, as Jesus said in Matthew 7, that as you judge, so you will be judged. Oh, well, it's pretty worrying, isn't it? But there's a standard. There is always a standard. And it's in God's Word. Or the way that we rephrase sin, you know, sin is just brokenness and pain. No, sin is evil. Sin is active. Sin is alive. Sin will destroy you. You know, a broken plate just sits on the ground and does nothing. It doesn't tell lies. It doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't defy God. It just sits there, broken. And we say, oh, we're so broken. You're more than broken. You're sinful. It's worse than that. The world needs to hear this. And the world needs to hear this because the world is basking in a false gospel today which says the self is good. And it says the self is the blueprint for your life. And what that is doing is immunizing this generation against the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's time we started to tell the truth. These are lies that are shutting people out of the kingdom of God. Lies that are shutting a new generation out of the kingdom of God. Jesus says the kingdom of God dawns on a person's soul with a totally different theme, and it dawns on a person's soul with the truth that you are not enough. You know, Jesus speaks to a wealthy church in Re Revelation, the church at Laodicea, and he says, you say I'm rich, I've become wealthy, and you don't know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And he goes on to say, therefore repent. That's his message to a church that is wealthy. And the problem we have today is we're not just materially wealthy by historical standards, we think we are spiritually wealthy. We're not poor in spirit, we're full of ourselves. That was an insult when I was growing up. Today it seems to be like a, you know, a philosophy of life, doesn't it? Um, it, was, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. It is impossible for someone who thinks they are spiritually rich to enter the kingdom of heaven because it doesn't belong to those people, said Jesus. 
And this is the theme really throughout all the Bible with all the greats. I mean, you hear the Apostle Paul, what does he say in Romans 7? In my flesh dwells no good thing. What does Peter say to the Lord? He says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. What does Moses say when, Jesus come, when God comes to him in the burning bush and says, go and do a work for me? He says, who am I? Who am I to do this work for you? Who am I to go to Pharaoh? He doesn't think much of himself. Isaiah says, woe is me, I'm undone. You know, this is the theme everywhere you look. And the world will tell us that the problems are all out there. They're all the phobias and the isms and the structures and the politics and the patriarchy and the this and the that and the other. Well, the truth is that when God is at work in a soul, we suddenly go, actually, the problem's in here. I mean, why is the world a mess? You know, I said to a school group the other day, I said, you are all very politically engaged these days, and you look out at the world and you say, what a mess. You know, why is it that the nations of the world don't get on? Why is it that politics is so broken? Why is it that they fight and they divide and there's schisms and they can't get anything done? If only we could go out there, we'd fix it. Um, I'm like, well, how are your relationships in your family? How are your relationships with your peers? Are you fighting with anyone? Do you play games with anyone? Are there struggles and problems? And you know what? The sin is you. And when people get more powerful and get together on the world stage, what was already there is only amplified. The problem is in here. Jesus' words on the matter, that which proceeds out of the man is what defiles the man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. All these things come from within and they defile the person. The solution is outside of me and someone who's poor in spirit is not looking within, they're looking somewhere else. Isaiah 57, 15 reinforces this, it's a great scripture. It says, I dwell in the high and holy place. Well, we know that, don't we, about God? He dwells in a high and holy place. And also, oh, He dwells somewhere else. Where is the other place where God lives? With Him who is of a contrite and a lowly spirit, to revive the spirit of the contrite and to re revive the heart of the lowly. The kingdom of heaven belongs to this person. And the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin and righteousness of judgment to begin this work in our heart. And then the other Beatitudes just flow out. Blessed are those who mourn. Well, does the Bible teach that simply being sad is a blessed state? No, but there's a kind of sadness that is good. The kind of sadness that comes with the person who knows that they're poor in spirit. Um, I was once speaking at a school camp and I had done my session and I went back to my room and I was preparing for the next session and there was a knock at the door. And I opened the door and there was a young man standing there and he was crying, he was he, just tears streaming down his face and I said, uh, oh, what's wrong? And he just blurts out to me, he said, I have a problem with pornography and I don't know what to do. And I thought for a minute and I said, turn around. I said, look out there, there's a whole bunch of boys playing a game of basketball. I said, why are they just playing basketball and laughing and smiling, and you're here, upset? Why? He seemed bewildered for a minute. I said, you know why? I said, because God is speaking to you. God is at work in your heart. And the Bible says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Because when we feel the crushing weight of our guilt, when we know our sinfulness, that is when the gospel comes and brings the true comfort that we need because there is an answer. Repentance leads to salvation in Jesus Christ. If you look at the life of Jesus, the Scriptures say that He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and wherever it is recorded that He wept, He is always weeping over sin, always. When he looks out at Jerusalem, he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing. Or when he weeps at the death of Lazarus, again, sin in the world, death in the world. 
You know, it's worth asking, do we grieve for our world? Are we only angry about what we see? Are we self-righteous about what we see because everyone's so dumb? Or are we grieved by people, sheep without a shepherd, as the gospel says, people who need the gospel, a nation that is rejecting the Savior? But you know, we should mourn about our world, but we should mourn about ourselves. The sinner has a Savior, that is our comfort. And it's very important for us to note in today's world that guilt is not a bad thing. You know, we find it very hard to allow people to feel guilt. We always want to rush in with soothing words. You know, Jesus didn't. You know, the Samaritan woman, go and get your husband. Eee, awkward. Like, he just, he just pressed the button and, and she felt something. Uh, Nicodemus, you must be born again. I know you're telling me you're righteous, but you need to start over. Just presses the button. The rich young ruler, go and sell all that you have. He just presses the button. Why? Because guilt is not a bad thing. And in a world that's obsessed with self and positivity and the exaltation of the identity, guilt, they say, is an enemy. We need to celebrate and be happy. No, guilt's not bad. It depends what you do with guilt. Guilt is bad if it takes you nowhere. But guilt that points you to the answer to salvation is nothing but good. Like I said, the day I found out I was a sinner going to hell was the best day of my life. <coughs> Pardon me. I said that on Australian television <coughs> because they were confronting me about uh, that guy who posted 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11 on his, uh, uh, on his, uh, his Instagram. Uh, and I said, well, you know, it's not a message of hate, it's a message of love. Because the day I found out I was a sinner going to hell was the best day of my life. And it's the only solution for the human race. So we're poor in spirit, we're mourning, we're broken down, we're sad, we know that we're poor in ourselves, we've got nothing of value. What happens now? Blessed are the meek. What is meek? Humble? Yeah, slightly different word. You know, the greatest um, description of meekness that I've heard is from a very ancient use of the word. Um, and it was a use that has come into some old English as well where it was said that to uh, take a wild horse and to break it in was to meek a horse. In other words, you have a horse that is going its own way, that is wild and that is out of control and doing its own thing and is subject to its own government and doing its own, living its own life. But you bring that horse's will into, the, into alignment with the will of an authority. And it's interesting, when that horse... Uh, when, when its will is aligned with the will of its master, all of a sudden that horse appears to be doing what it was always made to do, right? It's like this was its purpose. Uh, and that's what meeking is. It's to say, you know what? We no longer look to ourselves. We do what the psalmist says. I lift my eyes to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Someone who is no longer looking at themselves. They are looking outside of themselves and they are submitted to Christ because they know that in their flesh dwells no good thing, as the Apostle Paul would say. They are bringing themselves under another authority. They are looking to another solution. They are finding another answer. That's true meekness. And it is said in the Scriptures that Moses was the meekest man on all the earth. Um, but he was a very powerful man. He was a mighty man. He was a general. He was, you know, what a great guy. Incredible. The meekest man on the earth. What does it mean? I think it goes back to that day at the burning bush, which I mentioned just before. When Moses stood there and God said, go to Pharaoh and do this great thing, and Moses said, who am I? I cannot do this. And the phrase comes back from the bush, but I will go with you. That's meekness. I will go with you. And I'm sure many of us have had times in lives where we, our life where we know what we have to do and we've said, I can't do it. But the voice of God says, I will go with you. That's meekness, looking to another, self-will broken, sometimes traumatic, and many a conversion is through tears, many a conversion is through the grip of conviction, and it's traumatic in some ways. But we come out the other side and our self-will is gone and we have a new alignment and we say, as Scripture says, apart from Him, we can do nothing. Martin Luther writes this, he said, God made the universe out of nothing and He brings us to nothing because so long as we are nothing, He can make something out of us. 
If you go and look at Isaiah 6, and I'll mention this very quickly, you see a great case study in this. Uh, Isaiah sees the Lord high and lifted up on his throne. And in seeing the glory of God, several things immediately happen. The first thing he does is, is he says, woe is me. I'm undone or I'm deconstructed. What he's saying is that I've, 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 been, I've been made into nothing. And that's poor in spirit, isn't it? He sees the truth about himself. But also then he starts confessing his sin. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Well, that's mourning over his sin, isn't it? And of course, a bit of a problem because he's saying, I've got a dirty mouth and God is asking him to go and speak. Um, but then, of course, how does, what happens next? Well, there's the comfort, right? Because the angel takes one of the coals from off the altar with the tongs, takes it over and touches his lip and says, your guilt is cleansed, your sin is atoned for. And of course, that altar is pointing to Christ. And that's where the comfort comes from. And then notice how that little passage ends with Isaiah's commissioning. Very, very interesting turn of phrase. God says, who shall I send? Who will go for us? And it's interesting, Isaiah doesn't put his hand up and say, I'll go. His turn of phrase is crucial. He says, well, here I am. Send me. Meekness. I will go with you. Please come with me. And you see there in a commissioning of a prophet, and you'll see it in so many examples in the Bible if you apply this structure, um, where God works this way in human hearts. But how can we be this person? Because I'm focusing deliberately most of my time on these three Beatitudes because they are the most countercultural Beatitudes. And they're the threshold. And we say, how can I be that person? How can I have this real revelation about myself? It's, it's fascinating, you know. Um, it always happens when you see God. Moses says, show me your glory, and he's changed forever. Isaiah sees that vision, he's changed forever. Paul, on the road to Damascus, sees the risen Lord Jesus. He's never the same again. Um, Job, Jacob, and so on, they are changed by a vision of God. And you say, where can I see God? Listen to Peter. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. He's saying, we saw the glory of Christ, the glory of God. We're one of these people. We're never the same again. Verse 19, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's saying, we saw something. But he's saying, you know what? Until the coming of Christ, we have this even more fully confirmed. Where? In the Scriptures. You want to see God? You want to know who He is, His holiness, what He's like? The Scriptures contain the revelation. The Scriptures contain the answer. And it is such a tragedy that we live in an age when there's never been more Bibles. Every device, we've all got one, right? We've all got them in the house, they're all over the place, and it seems that they've never been less read. And it's no wonder that we're wallowing around in our gospel of identity and self-love, because we're not seeing God. Where do we see God? In His revealed Word. Where do we see what He's like? Where, where does He speak to us? Where does He come to us and reveal Himself to us? First and foremost is in His Word. Too long, didn't read version of that whole section is, read the Bible. <laughs> read the Bible. And you know, when we see the truth of God and God's Spirit works in our hearts and we go through all of this, there's a great change. And the first change is that we hunger and thirst for righteousness. We're still kind of empty, but we're looking out now, right? We're looking for something. We're not wallowing around. And it's a great question to ask ourselves in our Christian life. You know, we, we stumble, we fall. Even the Apostle Paul says, the good that I would do, I do not do. The evil that I wouldn't do, I do. A wretched man that I am, he says. You know, we all have the struggle. It's real. But at least the struggle's happening, right? That's one of the things that marks out a Christian, because the struggle happens when our desire is changed, when we're hungry, when we want something new. 
And, and that's the question we ask ourselves. You know, I, I used to know a, a, a preacher and he gave the example. He said a, a man came up to him after a sermon once and said, and he said, you know, uh, Peter, he said, I don't think I'm saved. He said, I don't know what to do about it. He said, why don't you think you're saved? He said, well, because he said, I can't stop sinning. He said, I just can't stop. He said, I struggle and I go on for a while and I fall and I pick myself up and later on I fall again. And so the preacher wisely says to him, tell me, how do you feel about this, these sins that you're committing? And he said, he clenched his fist so tight the knuckles went white and he said, I hate them! Like this. And the preacher said, well, praise God, I think you might be saved. <laughs> um, you know, Jesus loved righteousness, hated iniquity. Is that our heart? Is that the work of God within us? And actually, in the rest of Matthew 5, you see all those examples of the Pharisees minimizing righteousness, saying, oh, you shall not commit adultery. That means lust is fine, right? So they're sitting there reducing holiness to letters on a page because they don't actually hunger for holiness. They're trying to minimize what the law of God says. Be careful if you are minimizing holiness. If you're saying, oh, well, I didn't get raving drunk, just on the edge, you know, that kind of talk. Careful, very, very careful. And Jesus goes through adultery, uh, he goes through uh, uh, honesty, he goes through hatred and murder, and he says, you know what, if you love the lawgiver, if you're hungry for righteousness, you won't minimize this stuff. You won't just look at the letters on the page, you will honor the heart and the mind of the one who is holy. And when we're hungry and thirsty for things outside of ourselves, that transformation starts to manifest in these actual qualities of heart that, that mimic the qualities that God has. And the one that's mentioned here is mercy. Blessed are the merciful. You know, I've never heard a person described as merciful in my life. I've heard people described as good and kind and gracious, and I even heard a guy described as righteous once. Never have I had someone say, oh, Joe over there, the thing about him is he's very merciful. You know why I think that is? I just think it's one of those qualities like meekness that's just so out of this world. That quality by which we don't deal with others according to what they deserve. That's not the governing principle. Imagine if Jesus had dealt with us according to what we deserved. Imagine if that had any real impact on how he had dealt with us, we'd be lost forever. What does Psalm 103 say? He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. But as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. That's mercy. To be one who actually deals with others according to the overflow of God's character not according to the deficiency in their character. Now, the psalmist says, what is man that you are mindful of him? And it's the wrong question, isn't it? Because it's not about us, it's about God. He doesn't deal with us according to what we deserve. His mercy is open to us. And of course, those who live this way, who act this way, who are people of mercy, they are not only those who know God, but they are those who know God's mercy for themselves. And when you've been poor in spirit, when you've mourned, and when you've been meek and hungry and thirsty for righteousness, one thing is clear, you know that God has had mercy on your soul. And what can you do but go out and show that mercy to others? And then it transforms their whole life. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. This is a whole attitude of life. You know, when I was a kid, I, I, I got a, a commemorative coin from the Sydney Olympic Games and it was pure silver, and I was so pleased with it. It cost $80 or something, which at the time I thought was just super expensive. <coughs> and I took it home, and I opened it up, and I pulled out the Certificate of Authenticity. And to my great disappointment, the Certificate of Authenticity said, this coin is 99.98% pure silver. I thought, what? <laughs> 0.98? Couldn't they have got it to 100? in my ignorance. The idea being, you know, that coin was not perfectly pure, it had some other thing mixed into it. But a pure heart is a heart that's got no mixture of allegiance, uh, no mixture of desire, it's got one allegiance, one desire. And you say, well, what is that? Well, I'll tell you another example. Uh, there was for a time, uh, 
In the early 2000s in Australia, uh, uh, one of our deputy prime minister, so you know, our equivalent of, say, a vice president, uh, and he was a very, very strong Christian. His name was John Anderson. He's written a great book. And he tells a story how that when he was up in the parliament in Canberra, which is our capital city, not Sydney, believe it or not, uh, and he used to have another Christian colleague who would walk around the halls of the parliament and would occasionally bang on his door and just throw it open, uninvited, and it was mostly early in the morning, and he'd say, hey, John, remember today, you're playing to an audience of one, and he'd slam the door and walk away. And he said, it was such a good reminder, because you've got the media, you've got your constituents, you've got your colleagues, you've got the other, you've got so many people looking on, so many people to please, so many allegiances to manage, but he's just got that reminder constantly, you know what? Your life is for an audience of one, a pure heart, one who lives before the face of God and God alone. And the example of that, I would say, is Joseph. Remember, he's, I mean, Joseph himself is a handsome young guy, and that poses its problems when he goes to Egypt because there's a wife of one of the dignitary noblemen, uh, probably a beautiful woman. Joseph is, what, 17, 18? She starts making moves, making eyes at him. And what does Joseph do? You know, we think, we, we sometimes think, oh, well, obviously he ran away. Obviously, really? I mean, there are people who wouldn't. Let's be real about this. Anyway, she makes a move and he flees. And what are the words that come out of his mouth? He says, how can I do this great sin against my God? His family is a long way away. His accountability structures are far behind. Don't we fear when kids go to college in another state? Accountability structures left behind. No one's watching. Ah, oh, God's watching. He says, God is still here, and it's God who I serve. And that's why Matthew 6, the next chapter of the Sermon on the Mount, is so concerned with the secret life of the Christian. What is the state of our secret life? Where God and God alone sees, do we say, how can I do this great sin against my God? May it be ever so. We are people who live for an audience of one before the face of God alone, and that changes our whole life. And when the kingdom of God has come to us in this way, there is a change that comes from us to the world around us. And the first change is that we are peacemakers. You say, well, what does it mean to be a peacemaker? Does it mean to be really nice to people, to break up arguments, to pacify people, to not talk about things that are negative, to make people feel good? Do you know what the Bible, do you know what Jesus means when he says peace? He means peace with God. Peace with God that can't, with our, that through our Lord Jesus Christ, as Romans 5 and 1 would say. Peace with God that was won by the blood of His cross. In other words, we are those God has brought peace to our hearts because we are at peace with God. The gospel has had its way with us and we now are those who want to go and make that same peace in the hearts and the souls and the minds of others and to a world at large. Is that our desire? Is it? I mean, I was saying the other night in the Babylon talk, uh, how far do our desires for our neighbors go? Is it that they would all be conservatives? Is it that the Californians would stay in California? Or is it that they would know the living God? And does it change us and drive us? And do we look for those chances and, those, and pray for those opportunities? You know, don't forget to pray for these opportunities. When you pray for them, they come. Uh, I was feeling like I didn't have many opportunities for a while in Australia, and I prayed. Uh, and for some crazy reason, late one night in the rain, I decided to go for a walk. I don't know why I did that. It's just odd. Um, I mean, I was in a very, very safe area, so that wasn't a problem. But in the rain, I went out, and I was walking in the bush, as we would say, uh, and I came across a man who was in the process of committing suicide. And I got there just in the nick of time. And uh, we ended up talking until two o'clock in the morning, in the rain, uh, in the middle of the bush. And it was, you know, what do you do in those circumstances but tell them all about the gospel? It was the most remarkable thing. And that was an answer to prayer. You just don't know. I mean, you've got to be prepared, right, to take the opportunity when it comes. <laughs> uh, but God is merciful. And I've made mistakes before as well. And God comes back and He gives you another chance. Um, seek to be that 
peacemaker. And you know, when you are that kind of person, one thing you can be sure of is there's going to be a lot of people who surprisingly don't like it. Isn't that one of the tragedies of the human condition? Jesus came into the world and the world hated His holiness. They hated who He was because He showed them up, He confronted them, He was different. They didn't all hate Him, some loved Him. Some were drawn to the light, but many men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And so one of the things we have to understand is that if this is us, then we will be persecuted. Blessed are the persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Again, not other people, these people. Isn't that confronting? Or as the Apostle Paul would say, all who seek to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Doesn't mean you'll be fed to the lions. It doesn't mean you'll be, have your head cut off. Jesus says in the very next verse, He says, blessed are you when you are reviled, when people are angrily disgusted with you and persecuted. Uh, and, uh, and when people utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. What are we dealing with today? Bigots, homophobes, haters, uh, you know, and all sorts of insults about being stuck in the Stone Age, and, or as one of the state uh, governors in Australia said, uh, uh, he's called Christians bigoted quacks, he called them. Uh, I mean, this is false. None of this is true, I hope. I don't think it is, on the whole. Um, but that's the sort of thing Jesus has in mind. That will happen. But remember what He said, blessed are you. We need to believe that sometimes, because in a world where there are people who don't like us and don't like what we believe, we refrain from being the light and being visible in our beliefs because we think if people are angry with us, it'll be bad. No, Jesus says there's a blessing for you. There's something good that will come. This is why Paul and Silas sang hymns in jail all night. Blessed are the persecuted. They weren't crazy. They were happy. They were joyful. Because when those challenges come, we lean further into Christ and the joy of the Lord is our strength. We must always remember that promise and it will give us courage to stand when we need to stand. Um, it's a, I say to young people in Australia who are worried about losing friends, dropping out of social circles, uh, not getting ahead in their careers and all that because of their beliefs. I say, you know what, this is a feature, it is not a bug in the Christian life. And um, we need to understand that God has got the future in His hands when we honour Him, just like He did for Daniel. Daniel bore the shame, he bore the persecution, the reviling, and God had His future under control. And that's all we need. We need God on our side, not the world. That's for sure. And we close out with two things that will come from this life in relation to the world around us. Firstly, we will be salt. Secondly, we will be light. What's the thing about the salt? The thing about the salt is that it, 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 it cannot lose its taste. And you say, when does salt lose its taste? It loses its taste when the moisture seeps into it and it no longer works. In other words, when the environment that it's sitting in changes it. You know, we're in a very putrid, decaying, sinful environment, and the, the command through the salt is, don't let it change you. Don't let it decay the work of the kingdom of God in your heart. Stand against it resist it. And then when this wave of cultural decay goes across the nation, do you know where it will stop? your front door. Do you know where it will stop? At the gateway of your heart. And it will not be able to take more ground. It's like Daniel and Daniel's friend said, we will not bow to the idol that you've set up. You might be a despot and a king, you have no authority over us, and God can save us. But even if He doesn't, we still won't bow. That's the people we need to be. People who are salt, who stand against the decay, who will not participate in the sins of our age, and who will pursue holiness no matter the cost. So the salt is not compromised by its environment. It stands as that last defense. And then there's light. And by the way, we might all wonder, to what extent can we stand up and do this or do that? Um, to what extent can we be outspoken? Well, we do wonder about those things, but one thing we don't need to wonder about is this, at least we can commit ourselves to not compromising. 
That's the baseline. Let's start there. Um, and then, of course, the next thing is you become the light of the world. And the thing about the light of the world, the light that Jesus points out is that it's visible. It's not hidden under a basket. It's on a stand that gives light to the whole house. It's a city set on a hill that cannot be hidden. The goal is visibility. You know, the LGBT community are brilliant at this. Visibility. I drive around the neighborhoods of America and there are rainbow flags in every tenth house. And in some neighborhoods, it's every second house. And in some neighborhoods, it's every house. And you know, they're almost out competing each other for visibility. And you know, that visibility has done an amazing thing for that community. What if Christians are hiding in plain sight so often, aren't we? There's a lot we can do about that sometimes. I mean, we're just ordinary people. But are there ways we can be seen? Are there things we can do? Words we can say? Opportunities we can take? Uh, you know, I lived in Canberra in Australia, the most secular place in Australia. Unbelievably anti-God, openly, proudly anti-God. Uh, and uh, I deliberately would try and walk around with like a Christian fish on my lapel or a cross or something, anything. Uh, and it was interesting, it did precipitate a couple of conversations. You just don't know. Find some ways to be seen. Uh, it was great last night with that pro-life ministry at the gala event. What a visibility to go out to the abortion clinics to put an ultrasound van right there and to never forget the gospel in what's being done in those places. We've got to be visible. We've got to take ground for the kingdom of God. It begins with us, personal, small, and what a work it does when the light shines through us. Because finally, if we never forget that our good works are driven by the gospel, and if we always allow people to see that about us, that who we are, what we are, what we stand for, what we say, is because of the gospel, is because of Jesus Christ, is because of this great kingdom of heaven, two things will happen. One, hostility, and that discourages us, and it's loud and noisy and in your face, and Babylon's all up here in your face saying, shut up, shut up, shut up, you bigot. It's the worst thing we can do to shut up, because Jesus promises one other effect. People will see your good works, and they will glorify your Father who is in heaven. And that anger and that persecution and that hostility is there to make sure that the light goes out to make sure that the salt stays in its corner and to make sure that the testimony of the gospel through changed lives is not out there in the communities. And the worst mistake we make is to fold to that pressure. The worst mistake pastors make is to, is to capitulate on key doctrines of the faith because of that pressure. What they don't realize is that that distinctive, that salty distinctive and the light that shines from that reaches some. Uh, it's amazing in Australia, we used to put out all this content on LGBT issues because it's the issue of big time, the issue of the day over there. And I always thought, well, it's all just getting all this negative blowback until we started to get people writing into the ministry saying, I was gay, I saw your videos, I've become a Christian, find me a church. You can't believe what goes on. And we should accept it because the Bible says it will be effective. But it shocked me. We started getting all these testimonies from people coming out of the gay community because of the content, the biblical content we were putting out on identity, but the hostility against it. I mean, I was sued. The hostility against it was incredible. But we need to learn to stand against that hostility, to stay salty, if I could put it that way, and to keep the lights on because God says, then you will take ground for a greater kingdom. Then the Babylon's the Greek cultures of the world will be reached. It was only 12 once, it was only four once. Well, there's a lot more of us than that, isn't there? May God do a work in our day, let's pray. <clears throat> let's pray. Father in heaven, we ask that your spirit would do a work in us um, that is just beyond our power, that is beyond uh, what we can muster up in our own strength, but Father, that is in accordance with your saving and sanctifying power. Father, we pray that you would make us poor in spirit, that you'd make us grieve for our sin and the sin of our world, that you'd make us meek as Moses was meek, looking to you in all things. Father, make us pure in heart, serving you every day, hungry and thirsty for righteousness, that we might be what you would have us to be and have the right appetites, that we might take the gospel of peace to our world, and that therefore there would be a great light that shines in our day. 
Father, help us not to compromise, to be salt. Father, help that light to shine through us. And even when the challenges, the troubles, and the persecutions come, may we know that we can stand firm because people will glorify our Father in heaven. Lord, we pray that we'd be those who fulfill this prescription that Jesus has given for our day and our time. And we ask that it would be done in your power for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.